is Dr. Ron, and I really want to talk about some updated data on broad spectrum hemp oil, endocannabinoids, terpenes, and bioavailability. Disclaimer. Uh, as I talk about a lot of clinical data, I will be talking about diagnosis and disease states. Uh, however, no information in this talk should be used um, to claim treatment, diagnosis, cure, prevention of any disease state. Um, furthermore, a lot of the data I speak about on animal studies and should not be interpreted to have the same outcomes uh, in humans due to lack of uh, human trials. So without further ado, what I really want to get into the first topic is really I want to talk about the entourage effect. And what exactly is the entourage effect? So a lot of plants have different compounds of biochemicals within them that <clears throat> serve a particular purpose in the plants, but when ingested by humans, they um, have a very desirable effect uh, in terms of uh, wellness. And so the entourage effect is really the synergistic effect of different compounds and components uh, that are in plants to um, uh, assist in um, the pursuit of wellness in humans. And it's really uh, something described as a multi-compound interaction. So this was first talked about in 1998 in regards to um, cannabinoid receptors um, by Professor um, Ben Shabbat and Dr. McCollum. And so um, these, these um, professors looked at cannabinoid receptor activity and found that there's a synergistic effect amongst uh, multiple cannabinoids on, on these particular receptors. And from there, it kind of grew uh, into looking at uh, entourage effect of not beyond just cannabinoids, but also uh, terpenes, which I'll get into in a second. So the real question is how big is your entourage or what's in your entourage? So um, in some particular cases, you have uh, cannabidiols, which is CBD, and that's the one that everyone knows about. Lesser known is CBG, cannabigerols, which I'll highlight in a second, um, which is very important specifically uh, looking at the new data coming out. Uh, there's CBDV, CBC, there's other ones as well that I did not list because the list will go on and on. And there's particular terpenes as well. And um, I'll get into what terpenes are in a bit. Um, but, you know, as part of the entourage, does THC have to be there? And we found out, no, no, THC does not have to be there to be part of the entourage. And THC um, is uh, the psychoactive component of the um, marijuana plant. Um, but um, we find that even without THC, there's a lot of uh, beneficial uh, health effects. So let's focus on CBD for a second. And uh, because cannabidiol or CBD is probably the most famous in, uh, of, uh, of them all, of all the cannabinoids, but it is one of uh, many hundred cannabinoids that are found in the hemp plant. So Cannabidiols um, have multiple therapeutic properties for brain function, for inflammation, uh, brain protection, brain circulation. A lot of studies have been done on epilepsy, and there's actually pharmaceutical drugs um, made from uh, uh, CBD isolates um, to, uh, to, uh, to treat childhood um, seizures and caused by a rare genetic condition. Uh, in the United States. Um, there's um, uh, the use of cannabidiols is also very popular in Europe with some pharmaceutical medications in Europe with uh, multiple sclerosis as well. And so, um, but CBD and, and its effects on the brain are very, very, um, uh, very, very apparent. And in the case of traumatic brain injury, these cannabidiol receptors assist in neural protection after traumatic brain injury. And they actually, they actually help increase circulating of stem cells. It has a nice antidepressant effect and increase alertness and awakeness and improves markers on, on brain mapping uh, when we look at brain EEGs of people with traumatic brain injury. So a lot of good effects there. And, uh, and this is going into uh, a lot of details, and this is for um, those healthcare practitioners um, who are watching. And if this goes beyond you a little bit, don't worry about it. This is designed for practitioners. This slide is. Um, so I'm going to go into a little in depth of what cannabidiol's effects are on uh, portions of brain health. 
So um, when we look at memory loss or Alzheimer's disease, we really look at the hippocampal size. So if the hippocampus started degenerating at a more rapid pace, um, it's associated with aging and associated with some memory loss. What we found is that cannabidiols actually increase PPAR gamma, which is epigenetic signaling to stimulate hippocampal neurogenesis. So not just stop the breakdown of neural tissue in the hippocampus, but actual neurogen uh, neurogenesis, meaning that these neurons are, are generating, regenerating, if you will. And they activate uh, particular serotonin receptors that increase this hippocampal neurogenesis and also battles depression. Now, this is a powerful statement um, because very few things uh, can actually increase hippocampal size. Um, but uh, cannabidiols may be one of them. And uh, BDNF is also increased, which is brain-derived neurotrophic factor, um, which increases neuroplasticity in the brain by allowing the brain to, to accommodate to particular toxins, inflammatory processes, and even ischemic processes. And we know that cannabidiols increase the proliferation of uh, NPCs, uh, which are basically neuroprogenitor cells and stem cells. And these are neural cells that differentiate into neural tissue to help with the regeneration. And uh, neural protection is ischemia too by suppression of, of these particular inflammatory mediators like uh, TNF-alpha and of kappa B um, during ischemic injury. And so this is just a quick slide for the practitioners in the group who are a little more interested in the, in the data behind the cannabidiols with references as well. So moving on to CBD and pain, cannabidiols actually improve um, a lot of different types of pain. So there's incisional pain after surgery, um, there's painful inflammation and nerve pain, and um, th um, there's also pain from drug withdrawal, and cannabidiols actually help with that as well. It improves pain from arthritis and even migraines. So moving into CBG, cannabigerol. So CBD um, is actually made from CBG. Uh, CBG is a precursor to CBD and THC and as well as other uh, cannabinoids. But let's look at this master precursor and what it really does. So it's a nine psychoactive component. So if you ingest it into your body, it does not turn into THC in the body. It only turns into THC in the plant. So it's non-psychoactive. And it occurs naturally in plants in very trace amounts, um, generally because it's there to differentiate into other cannabinoids. And it's pretty rare and expensive to, to harvest and breed. And a lot of uh, hemp these days are bred for higher CBG contents um, due to some of the studies I'm about to show you. And it's got many potential medicinal benefits itself. So a little bit of history of CBG or cannabigerol. Um, from 1990 to 2015, it's been, it's been shown to help in various different uh, disease states. Um, uh, they're all in animal studies though, and uh, possibly good for glaucoma and possibly has an antibacterial property to it, antifungal property to it. It's been shown to improve in inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's disease, also colitis, that was studied in 2013. 2014 is a possible agent to combat colorectal cancer by inhibiting some of the uh, cancer proliferating cells uh, in colon cancer. 2015, it's been shown to have uh, in mice model uh, some improvement in mice with Huntington's disease. And, and also in 2015, talks about there's a study talking about helping possibly with bladder control as well. Now, that's a bit of a history behind it, but, um, but in 2018 is really the year that CBG came into light for a lot of different research studies. So let's talk about 2018, what we found in 2018 with cannabigerol. And in one study in 2019 as well. So as far as brains and nerves, uh, cannabigerol has been shown to protect nerves in Lou Gehrig's disease, uh, inflammatory states, as well as Parkinson's disease. So this is a very fascinating thing to look at. Um, 2019, it shows that it assists in fat metabolism. Another study in 2018 showed that it helps prevention of complications of diabetes. And as far as the skin's concerned, there's another 2018 study that shows uh, cannabigerol decreases allergic contact dermatitis. And, um, and also it's got a very interesting antioxidant properties so to promote the anti-aging effect. So as far as the wellness compound, it's a very, uh, very good one, uh, just like how uh, cannabidiols are, um, cannab cannabigerol or CBG is, is starting to be uh, very well studied. 
So moving on to terpenes, what exactly are terpenes? So they're the aromatic compounds made by plants. So they have a smell and they have a taste to them. That's why they're called aromatic compounds. And they're found in many plants, not just hemp. And they give plants their unique smell and taste and they have their own health benefits as well. So terpenes and terpenoids have their own mechanism of action uh, that's really aside from what the, canna uh, the cannabinoids can do. And they have a really good entourage effect together as well as with other cannabinoids. And they exist in less than 1% of the hemp plant from cannabis sativa. And they readily cross cell membranes, so it's easily delivered and help with nerves and muscles and neurotransmitters as well. So um, let's go through the list of terpenes now that we have here. One is beta caryophyllin beta caryophyllin um, is, uh, is very much talked about, exists in a lot of different hemp strains, and the beta caryophyllin itself is actually added to a lot of different hemp oils because it has a lot of different properties, uh, similar to what the cannabinoids do. Um, it's, it suppresses uh, cancer cell growth, antidepressant effect, antibacterial effect, anti-anxiety, and pain as well. And we've got one study that's showing neuroprotective effects on multiple sclerosis. And terpenaline uh, is another terpene, and it's got its own antifungal properties, antioxidants, and helps with cancer cells as well. Limonene. Limonene tastes good because it tastes very citrusy, and that's part of the component of why people like to use it in particular compounds. Um, but it helps breathing with during asthma attacks, uh, similar to what peppermint oil does, actually. It's got its own tumor, uh, anti-tumor activity, antifungal anti activity, and this one study actually helps with acid reflux and um, and uh, H. pylori suppression, which is uh, H. pylori is a bacteria that causes acid reflux and stomach cancers, uh, amongst and stomach ulcers and duodenal ulcers as well. Um, it helps protect against oxygen radicals, so that means it's an antioxidant, and it helps uh, immune function as well. From uh, support against fungal infections. So limonene is a very important compound here. Uh, linalool or linalool depends on which part of the country you're from uh, or the world uh, the pronouncing it. It helps improve the pain, helps suppress seizures, uh, activity, anti-inflammatory, anti-psychotic, anti-anxiety effects. And these are all animal studies that have been done in the past uh, with that. In fact, a lot of these studies are done with multiple terpenes because these terpenes all exist together. Rarely are they by themselves. Uh, myrcene, also another uh, terpene. It's got its anti-inflammatory effects, anti-diabetic neuropathy effects, and helps with nerve pain. It's anti-psychotic effects and helps with sleep as well. Humulene, um, uh, very similar to the last two uh, compounds basically because humulene is generally studied with myrcene and linalool or even limonene and uh, and humulene has its own uh, uh, pain anti-pain effects antibacterial anti-inflammatory uh, effects as well and uh, geraniol has very interesting mechanism of action because it helps uh, significantly with uh, neuropathic pain neuropathic pain is really difficult to control in medicines it's pain uh, that's stemming from the inflammation or aggravation of nerves. Um, there's something called trigeminal neuralgia, which is a very painful condition uh, with the nerve irritation in the face. And there's peripheral neuropathy generally affecting the, the limbs. And it also helps with spinal cord injury. Um, it's got its own anti-tumor and anti-inflammatory effects as well. And so that concludes the, the terpene discussion. Just on some of just some just the terpenes. Um, and I want you guys to understand that these terpenes definitely coexist together in nature. And, uh, and they have very similar effects because generally they're studied together. And, um, and they have a very good uh, uh, entourage effect when combined with other terpenes and uh, other cannabinoids as well. So this is the update of um, the endocannabinoids uh, terpenes. Uh, um, and what's been really going on uh, in the last uh, couple years. I just want to end by saying that um, there's a lot of hemp oil strains that's been hybridized to, to have a very uh, broad spectrum profile, and uh, that's the name of the game in 2019 is to be as broad spectrum as possible to, um, to encourage the entourage effect of these uh, botanicals. Uh, in hopes of uh, improvement and our total body wellness. So 
Thank you, everyone, for listening. Uh, I appreciate uh, everyone's attention.